One of the most difficult and contentious areas of our law today is the resolution of disputes generated by a conflict between, on the one hand, the religious beliefs of an individual, and on the other hand, actions which that individual is required to take, whether that requirement is by a public body, a private employer, or another individual. The problem is particularly acute where the conflict is directly or indirectly between one individual's religious beliefs and another's non-religious human rights. It is a subject that affects many countries as they have become more liberal, multicultural, and secular. The issues in countries which are members of the Council of Europe and of the European Union, like England and Wales, are affected by European jurisprudence as well as national law. The development of the law in England is of particular interest because the Protestant church, or the Protestant churches, are the established, uh, is the established church of England, but the protection for secular and other non-Protestant minorities has progressed at a pace and in a way that would have been beyond the comprehension of most members of society, including judges and politicians, before the Second World War. The subject is large and complex, and the law relevant to it is growing at a remarkably fast pace. For the purpose of legal commentary, it falls naturally into two parts. First, tracing the legal history and the reasons for the developments I have mentioned. And secondly, analyzing the modern jurisprudence. In this address, I propose to concentrate particularly on the first part, although inevitably I shall refer, if briefly, to the contemporary developing jurisprudence. I think that it is important for any sensible public debate on these sensitive and important issues that we understand from a legal perspective where we have come from and why we have arrived here. The Queen's coronation oath in which she promised to maintain in the United Kingdom the Protestant religion and the rights and privileges of the bishops and clergy of the Church of England reflects the unique constitutional position of Christianity in Britain and in particular the Protestant churches. The Queen is defender of the faith, being the Christian faith. The Act of Settlement 1701 laid down that only Protestant descendants are eligible to succeed as monarchs. A Roman Catholic is specifically excluded from succession to the throne. The sovereign must be in communion with the Church of England and must swear to preserve the established Church of England and the established Church of Scotland. The Archbishop of Canterbury, the Archbishop of York, the Bishop of London, the Bishop of Durham, the Bishop of Winchester, and the 21 longest serving bishops from other dioceses in the Church of England are entitled to sit as of right as members of the House of Lords by virtue of their ecclesiastical offices. They are known as the Lord Spiritual. No representatives from other religious organizations have a right to membership of the House of Lords. The historical significance of Christianity in the application of our laws is a necessary starting point for any analysis of the relationship between religion, the rule of law, and discrimination. In 1676, Chief Justice Hale, in convicting the defendant of blasphemy in Taylor's case, said as follows, to say religion is a cheat is to dissolve all those obligations whereby the civil societies are preserved and Christianity is a parcel of the laws of England. Therefore, to reproach the Christian religion is to speak in subversion of the law." End of quote. As Lord Radcliffe later said, to Chief Justice Hale, the bonds of civil society were preserved by religion, and the major institutions of society, including government and the law, had it as their duty to support that form of it known as Christianity. That approach is exemplified by three historic societal and legal trends, the treatment of Jews, the law relating to blasphemy, and the laws relating to homosexuality. Following a prolonged period of persecution, the Jews were finally expelled from England by Edward I in 1290, the first European country to do so. One commentator has described medieval England as, I quote, innovative and precedent establishing in its anti-Semitism, end quote. Jews started to return with the tacit approval of Oliver Cromwell in the middle of the 17th century, but foreign-born Jews faced severe legal obstacles to carrying on a livelihood here. The so-called Jew Bill of 1753 was enacted to enable Jews to become naturalized without first converting. 
But there was a huge popular outcry, including the protest that naturalized Jews would threaten the livelihood of Christian merchants and shopkeepers, and they would come to be a threat to, uh, to threaten Christian political authority, and that it was proper to reciprocate in some measure Jewish enmity towards Christianity. The act was almost immediately repealed due to the popular opposition. That was the political setting for the approach of the judges, who considered it, that it was their duty to ensure that the law gave no countenance to anything that involved a conflict with Christian beliefs. So a gift for the advancement of the Jewish religion was held illegal by Lord Hardwick, Lord Chancellor, in 1754, on the ground that it would advance that which was contrary to the Christian religion. It was not until 1826 that the right of naturalization was finally extended to Jews. It was not until 1871, with the Promissory Oaths Act, that Jews were altogether free of legal disabilities on account of their faith and ethnicity. Turning to blasphemy, the common law offence was entirely the result of judicial decisions over three centuries. It was only abolished in the Criminal Justice and Immigration Act 2008. Until the 19th century, blasphemy was constituted by any attack on Christianity in general. It was then narrowed to scurrilous vilification. The offence was restricted to attacks on Christianity. Notably, for example, the court rejected the right of Mr. Abdul Chowdhury to bring a private prosecution against Salman Rushdie and the publishers of the Satanic Verses for, in the words of the summonses, a blasphemous libel concerning Almighty God, Allah, the supreme deity common to all religions of the world. Christian values were, of course, reflected in the law and the views of judges on sexual issues such as homosexuality. Chapters 18 and 20 of Leviticus were the source of medieval Christianity's rejection of homosexuality and continued to be so for many Christians and for the, or that matter Orthodox Jews. The rejection found its way into the common law and statute. 1290 saw the first documented mention in English common law of a punishment for homosexuality. The Buggery Act 1533 brought sodomy within the scope of the statute law for the first time and made it punishable by hanging. It was not until over 300 years later that the Offences Against the Person Act 1861 abolished the death penalty for buggery. In 1887, Oscar Wilde was sentenced to two years in prison with hard labour under the Criminal Amendment Act 1885, which created the offence of committing gross indecency with another man. The offences of, of committing buggery with another person and of committing gross indecency with another man were carried forward into the Sexual Offences Act 1956. The classic common law view of Christianity as part of the law of England began to soften in the second half of the 19th century when scientific advances raised questions which could not sensibly be debated without a discussion of biblical texts and Christian doctrine free from the threat of prosecution there also began to grow a genuine appreciation of the importance of freedom of speech. Accordingly, by the middle of the century, blasphemy had ceased to be regarded as affecting the security of the state or as challenging the very basis of the law. The law conferred considerable, considerably greater latitude for religious debate. In the Crown against Ramsey and Foote in 1883, Lord Coleridge, Chief Justice, said as follows, the mere denial of the truth of Christianity is not enough to constitute the offence of blasphemy. I now lay it down as law that if decencies of controversy are observed, even the fundamentals of religion may be attacked without the writer being guilty of blasphemy. It was not, however, until the seminal decision of the House of Lords in Bowman and Secular Society in 1917, which upheld the validity of a testamentary bequest to the Secular Society, notwithstanding that its main object involved a denial of Christianity, that it was authoritatively de 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 determined that the proposition Christianity is part of the law of England was held to be incorrect. Accordingly, the broad picture until the end of the Second World War was of a society in which the law gave special recognition and protection to one religion, Christianity, but in a manner which increasingly recognized the importance of temperate free speech and philosophical scientific debate. There were no anti-discrimination laws in relation to other faiths, beliefs, or conduct, or conduct specifically designed to protect or enhance the rights of minorities. That state of affairs has plainly changed beyond all recognition since the middle of the 20th century. The foundation stones for the remarkable transformation lay in the reaction to the atrocities of Nazism and fascism. 
That reaction was embodied in the preamble to the 1945 Charter of the United Nations, the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the 1950 European Convention on Human Rights, which I'll call the Convention. They enshrine an ethos of equality in dignity and rights, as distinct from simple majoritarianism, that has come to reflect one of the core values of liberal Western democracy. It is possible to identify three overriding factors which, in part building on these found, those foundations, have diminished the centrality of Christianity in the application of our laws and resulted in the complex balancing of a range of rights of which the manifestation of Christian beliefs is only one. First, there are homegrown discrimination laws relating to race. Secondly, there is the remarkable transformation brought about by European influence in particular the Convention and membership of what is now the European Union. Thirdly, there is the huge shift in social and moral values away from the tenets of a conservative or traditional Christianity, most notably in the support for same-sex relationships, which has resulted in legislation despite opposition by observant Christians and those of other faiths. Let us start with race. The connection with religion may at first sight seem odd what is clear, however, is that the legislation out outlawing discrimination on the ground of race brought with it an element of anti-discrimination in relation to non-Christian faiths due to the overlap between ethnicity and religion, as in the case of Sikhs and Jews. Moreover, the legislation not only reflected a more diverse community and a greater embracing of difference, but it provided the model for later hate crime legislation in relation to, for example, religion and sexual orientation. This race aspect to the development of our anti-discrimination law is a uniquely British phenomenon due to Britain's colonial history and association with Commonwealth countries. The very first Race Relations Act, the 1965 Race Relations Act, was enacted to address discrimination against black people, and in particular, recent immigrants from the new Commonwealth. This made incitement to racial hatred a criminal offence. Subsequently, the Race Relations Act 1968 outlawed racial discrimination by employers and trade unions in, amongst other things, the provision of goods, facilities and services to members of the public. The Race Relations Act 1976 gave individuals the right of access to a court in their own name to seek redress for unlawful racial discrimination in various fields. The Crime and Disorder Act 1998 provided for the enhancement of sentences for criminal, for criminal offences on the basis of racial motivation and for racially aggravated forms of the offences of assault, criminal damage and harassment. I turn to the European influences on our law in the area of religious rights and their interface with other values. Before I do so, however, it is worth emphasising once again that while European influences have been critical, our own peculiarly British social history and race legislation reflect a homegrown, non-European context of multiculturalism, including non-Christian ethnic traditions, in which tolerance and protection of difference is a pronounced feature. It is no accident that, as we shall see, the extension of hate crimes to embrace both religion and sexual orientation has been grafted on to the pre-existing race crime legislation. I start with the Convention. The United Kingdom was the first country to ratify the European Convention on Human Rights in November 1950. Particularly significant for the purpose of this address are Articles 8, concerning right to respect for private and family life, Article 9, freedom of thought, conscience and religion, Article 10, freedom of expression, and Article 14, prohibition of discrimination, and Article 2 of the first protocol, right to education. Uh, just in case there are people here who don't know the full text of Article 9, I'm going to read it out so you can follow the, the, the um, address as I'm giving it. So Article 9 is as follows. It's headed Freedom of Thought, Conscience and Religion. And the first part is as follows. Everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief and freedom either alone or in community with others and in public or private to manifest his religion or belief in worship, teaching, practice, and observance. Second part is, freedom to manifest one's relief or, relief or, or beliefs shall be subject only to such limitations as are prescribed by law and are necessary in a democratic society 
in the interests of public safety, for the protection of public order, health or morals, or for the protection of the right and freedoms of others. The following initial points must be made about Article 9. First, the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights um, has highlighted the importance of the rights protected by Article 9 in a pluralist democratic society. In Sahin and Turkey, decision in 2005 of the Grand Chamber of the European Court, it said as follows, the court reiterates that as enshrined in Article 9, freedom of thought, conscience and religion is one of the foundations of a democratic society within the meaning of the convention. This freedom is, in its religious dimension, one of the most vital elements that go to make up the identity of believers and their conception of life. But it is also a precious asset for atheists, agnostics, skeptics and unconcerned. The pluralism indissociable from a, de from a democratic society, which has, which has been dearly won over the centuries, depends on it. That freedom entails, in Aurelia, freedom to hold or not to hold religious beliefs and to practice or not to practice a religion, end of the quote. Secondly, as appears from that quotation and other cases, a belief may fall within the protection of Article 9 and Article 2 of the First Protocol, even though it has nothing to do with religion as commonly understood, provided that it satisfies some minimum requirements as to seriousness, cogency, and recognition of human dignity. Thirdly, there is a critical distinction under Article 9 between the freedom to hold a belief and the freedom to express or manifest a belief. The former right is absolute. The latter right, the right to manifest belief, is a qualified right. Fourthly, the protection conferred on freedom of thought, conscience and religion article, under Article 9 must, of course, take its place alongside and must accommodate the other freedoms and protections conferred by the Convention. As the European Court said in Otto Preminger Institute against Austria in 1995, and I quote, those who choose to exercise the freedom to manifest their religion, irrespective of whether they do so as members of a religious majority or a minority, cannot reasonably expect to be exempt from all criticism. They must tolerate and accept the denial by others of their religious beliefs, and even the propagation by others of doctrines hostile to their faith, end quote. The ethos of mutual respect and tolerance applies equally where several religions coexist in the same population. Fifthly, the European Court acknowledges the wide divergence between the national traditions and societal values of the different member states in relation to Article 9 rights and the political sensitivities surrounding those rights. Accordingly, it gives member states a wide margin of appreciation in relation to the balancing exercise under Article 9 of the second, second section of Article 9. Even allowing that wide margin of, pre, of appreciation, one can see immediately from these principles that they represent a quite different societal, so, a quite different social, political and legal environment to the Christian-centric one that existed in Britain before the Second World War. Many of the early cases under Article 9 concerned prohibitions on the right to wear items of clothing regarded by the applicant as having religious significance. There have been a number of cases on religious clothing in this jurisdiction. In the Crown, uh, on the part of uh, SB against the governors of Denby High School, the claimant schoolgirl who was a Muslim wished to wear a jilbab, a long coat-like garment which effectively concealed the shape of the female body and was considered to represent stricter adherence to the tenets of the Muslim faith than the shawar, than the shawar kameez, which is one of the uniform options permitted by her school. There were other schools in the area where the wearing of the jilbab was permitted, and in one of which she eventually enrolled. The House of Lords held that since the wearing of a, jil of a jilbab was a sincere manifestation by the claimant of her religious belief, Article 9.1 was engaged, but that since there was no evidence to indicate that she would have had any difficulty attending another school where pupils were permitted to wear the jilbab, the refusal to allow her to attend school wearing a jilbab did not amount to an interference with her right to manifest her religious beliefs in practice or observance. Furthermore, the defendant's insistence on their policy on uniforms being adhered to was a limitation prescribed by law which was proportionate to its purpose and was objectively justified under Article 9 too, 
even if it had interfered with the claimant's right to manifest her, religious, her religion under Article 9.1. In a wader against the United Kingdom, a 2013 case in the uh, European Court, the applicant, a practicing Coptic Christian employed by British Airways, claimed that British Airways had directly and indirectly discriminated against her and was in breach of Article 9 of the Convention when it refused to permit her to wear a cross visible to customers. The European Court held that there had been a violation of Article 9. On the facts, Mr. Wider's insistence on wearing a cross visibly at work was motivated by her desire to bear witness to her Christian faith and was a manifestation of her religious belief which attracted the protection of Article 9. The court said that in order to count as a manifestation within the meaning of Article 9, there must exist a sufficiently close and direct nexus between the act and the underlying belief. A manifestation of religious belief within Article 9 is not limited, however, to an act of worship or devotion, which forms part of the practice of a religion or belief, or to an act in fulfilment of a duty required by the religion question. The court acknowledged that there is case law which indicates that if a person is able to take steps to circumvent a limitation placed on his or her freedom to manifest religion or belief, there is no interference with the right under Article 9.1. The court, however, distinguished employment cases, which was Miss Awade's case, where, of course, there's always an option for the employee to resign from the job and change employment. The court determined that where an individual complains of a restriction of freedom or religion in the workplace, rather than holding that, rather than holding that the possibility of changing the job would negative any interference with the right, the better approach would be to weigh that possibility in the overall balance when considering whether or not the restriction is proportionate. The court held accordingly that there was an interference with Miss Awada's right to manifest her religion, and the only question was whether that was justified under Article 9.2. Since the interference with Miss Awada's Article 9 rights was not directly attributable to the state, the court's task was to examine whether in all the circumstances her right freely to manifest her religion was sufficiently secured within the domestic legal order and whether a fair balance was struck between her rights and those of others. The court concluded that a, that a fair balance had not been struck. It acknowledged that the aim of British Airways uniform code was legitimate, namely to communicate a certain image of the company and to promote recognition of its brand and its staff. The court held, however, that the domestic courts had accorded that aim too much weight it had failed to give sufficient weight to the consideration that the desire to manifest religious belief is a fundamental right, both because a healthy democratic society needs to tolerate and sustain pluralism and diversity, and because of the value to an individual who has made, a religious, who has made religion a central tenet of his or her life, to be able to communicate that belief to others. Furthermore, on the facts of the case, there was no evidence of any real encroachment on the interests of others. Miss Awada's cross was discreet, it did not detract from her professional appearance, and there was no evidence of the wearing of other previously authorised and there was and there was no evidence that the wearing of other previously authorised items of religious clothing, such as turbans or hijabs, had any negative impact on British Airways brand or image. Chaplin against the United Kingdom, another 2013 case, was decided by the European Court of Human Rights at the same time as Awida but with a different outcome. Miss Chaplin was a Christian who, like Miss Awida, wore a cross on a chain around her neck as a manifestation of her religious belief. She was employed by an NHS trust as a nurse. The trust had a uniform policy based on guidance from the Department of Health, which prohibited the wearing of necklaces. The reason for the restriction of jewel on jewellery was to protect the health and safety of nurses and patients as it posed a risk of injury or infection. Miss Chaplin was asked to remove the cross and chain, but refused to do so, and was moved to a non-nursing position, which subsequently ceased to exist. The European Court held, consistently with its reasoning in Oeda, that there was an interference with Miss Chaplin's Article 9 -1 rights, and the issue was whether the interference by the trust, a public body, was necessary in a democratic society in pursuit of one of the aims set out in the second part of Article 9. The court considered that the interference was justified on the facts. It considered that the reason for asking Ms. Chaplin to remove the cross, namely the protection of health and safety on a hospital ward, was inherently of a greater magnitude than that which applied in respect to Ms. Awada. Further, clinical safety was a field in which the domestic authorities must be allowed a wide margin of appreciation. It followed that the court was unable to conclude 
that the measures of which Miss Chaplin complained were disproportionate. Reference to employment now takes us to our membership since 1972 of what is now the European Union. Membership of the European Union has resulted in a further layer of rights and obligations bearing on the manifestation of religious beliefs and their reconciliation with other rights and obligations. This has produced legal complexity and cases of considerable difficulty and sensitivity. I'm not here concerned with the European Union's Charter of Fundamental Rights. Rather, I'm concerned with specific legislation of the European Union bearing on the issues of religion and discrimination and consequential legislation in the United Kingdom. The European, the European Community Framework Directive of 2000 required member states to outlaw discrimination connected to religion and belief, disability, sexual orientation and age in employment and related fields. What is immediately striking is that the framework directive not only for the first time in Europe expressly outlawed discrimination in relation to sexual orientation, but it did so alongside an express protection against discrimination connected with religion or belief and without conferring any superiority of the one over the other. Yet, as history has shown, and as I've recounted, religion and sexual orientation are often in conflict. The United Kingdom introduced two sets of regulations to give effect to the anti-discrimination provisions in the framework directive concerning religion or belief and sexual orientation in employment and related fields. These were the Employment Equality Religion or Belief Regulations in 2003 and the Employment Equality Sexual Orientation Regulations in 2003. The subsequent history of this line of legislation can be briefly summarised. Part 2 of the Equality Act 2006 contained, contained wide-ranging provisions outside the employment field, making discrimination on the grounds of religion and belief unlawful, for example in the provision of goods, facilities or services, the disposal of premises, the conduct of an education establishment and the performance of functions by a public authority, subject to certain specified exceptions. Pursuant to Part 3 of the 2006 Act, the Equality Act Sexual Orientation Regulations 2007 were made, outlawing sexual orientation discrimination across similar areas. The relevant anti-discrimination provisions are now to be found in the Equality Act 2010. I've highlighted these provisions in relation to sexual orientation because the way the law has from time to time related to homosexual conduct and gay rights, or the absence of them, is an indication of the influence of religion and Christianity in, in particular within our society and polity. The change in that respect in the last 50 years has been on any footing dramatic. The Wolfenden Report, published in September 1957, recommended that, and I quote, homosexual behavior between consenting adults in private should no longer be a criminal offense, end quote. The recommendation of the report was highly controversial and was opposed by many. They included senior judges who, in publicly expressing their views, reflected their social and religious conservatism. Lord Devlin, a Roman Catholic, attacked the philosophical basis of the report in his book, The Enforcement of Morals, in a famous exchange with Professor H.L.A. Hart. Ten years after the Wolfenden Report, homosexual acts between consenting adults over 21 in private were legalised by the Sexual Offences Act 1967. In the 1977 gay, gay news trial, there occurred what in retrospect was one of the seminal events in the history of the post-war post tension between the prom promotion of religious and faith values and what are now generally accepted as core values of a pluralist liberal Western democracy, namely press freedom and the right to express irreligious or even anti-religious views. The defendants were the publishers and the editor of Gay News, who were charged with blasphemous libel. Gay News had published a poem which purported, and I quote here, to describe in explicit detail acts of sodomy and fellatio with the body of Christ immediately after the moment of his death. And that's taken from the speech of, uh, of the judgment of Lord Justice Roskill in the Court of Appeal. The defendants were duly convicted by a majority verdict for 10 to 2, and the judge imposed on the editor a sentence of nine months' imprisonment suspended for 18 months, a fine of £500, and on the publishers, a fine of, of £1,000. 
The convictions were upheld in the Court of Appeal, but the prison, but the prison sentence was quashed as inappropriate. That was in itself a small but nonetheless significant nod in the direction of pluralism, dissent, and free speech. The moment which many will have seen as the most decisive modern victory of religious morality over those without faith or respect for religion proved to be the swan song of the criminal offence of blasphemy. The commissioners of the Law Commission of England and Wales began consideration of the abolition or reform of the offences of blasphemy and blasphemous libel in July 1977 upon the very conclusion of the trial. The Law Commission published its final report in June 1985, which highly unusually put forward both a majority and a minority recommendation. The majority recommendation, the, the majority recommendation was the abolition of blasphemy and blasphemous libel without any replacement. There were no successful prosecutions for blasphemy or blasphemous libel after the gay news case, although it took a further 23 years following the publication of the Law Commission report for Parliament to abolish the offences of blasphemy or blasphemous libel in the Criminal Justice and Immigration Act 2008. The eventual repeal reflected an inexorable process of confining the importance of religion generally and Christianity in particular in its interface with other social and moral values. As the 20th century reached its close, there was a marked extension of gay rights. In July 1997, the European Commission expressed the opinion that the fixing of the minimum age for ho lawful homosexual activities between men at 18, rather than 16 as for sexual relations between a man and a woman, violated Articles 8 and 14 of the Convention. After two attempts to introduce legislation to rectify the position, which were rejected by the House of Lords in its parliamentary capacity, the age of consent to lawful homosexual acts was lowered to 16 by use of the Parliament Act 1911. In 1999, the European Court of, Ju of Human Rights held that investigation into the sexual lives of members of the armed services and their subsequent discharge on grounds of their homosexuality was a breach of Article 8. As a result, in 2000, the government lifted the ban on lesbian and gay men serving in the armed forces. Then from 2000 came the European legislation to which I've referred, outlawing discrimination in relation to sexual orientation as well as race and religion. As the history I've outlined clearly, outlined clearly indicates, it would be quite wrong to regard the protection of gay and lesbian rights as a purely European dimension imposed on an unwilling Christian-centric United Kingdom. The European dimension is important, but it must be remembered that the Wolfenden Report and the relevant provisions of the Sexual Offences Act 1967 had nothing to do with European legislation or jurisprudence. They were consequences of changes in political and social values in the pluralist and tolerant democracy that is now an overriding characteristic of Britain today and which produced Britain's original homegrown anti-discrimination race laws. Similarly, the recognition of the freedom to express views inconsistent with Christian teaching by the abolition of the offence of blasphemy was independent of European influence. This can also be seen in extensions of the stirring up or incitement offences, the so-called hate crimes, and of the enhanced sentencing regime, which were originally restricted to race. Since 2001, those hate crimes have been extended to religious hatred and hatred on the ground of sexual orientation. There was no obligation under EU, EU legislation or the convention to extend the criminal law in these ways. Equally, the enactment of the Civil Partnership Act 2004 and more recently, the Marriage Same-Sex Couples Act 2013, allowing same-sex couple, couples to marry, were expressions of domestic political will and not a requirement of membership of the EU or the Council of Europe. I've highlighted this point because one of the most difficult and sensitive issues currently faced by the courts is the extent to which it is legally permissible for public institutions in our law to favour one protected right over another. This has arisen most markedly in the friction between the right of sincere Christians to manifest their religious beliefs, notably belief in the sinfulness of homosexual practices, and the right of gay men and lesbians not to be discriminated against. Both can claim to rely on Articles 8, 9 and 14 of the Convention and on the anti-discrimination provisions now to be found in the Equality Act 2010. Important recent cases provide guidance on how the courts should approach these difficult conflicts between the manifestation of Christian, or indeed other, religious beliefs 
and the protection and promotion of secular values and other conduct protected by the Convention and anti-discrimination legislation. In Le Deal in the United Kingdom, 2013 case determined by the European Court of Human Rights, the claimant, a registrar of births, marriages and deaths employed by the London Borough of Islington, before the employed before the introduction of civil partnerships for same-sex couples, refused to officiate at civil partnerships on the ground that, as an Orthodox Christian, she believed that marriage is the union of one man and one woman for life. Her employer, the council, initiated disciplinary proceedings because, by refusing to conduct civil partnership ceremonies, she had failed to comply with the local authorities' code of conduct and, and equality and diversity policy. Ms. Ledeal applied to the European Court of Human Rights on the ground that the local authorities' decision not to make an exception for her and for others in her situation amounted to discrimination in breach of Article 14. The court held that there had been no violation of Article 14 taken in conjunction with Article 9. The court noted that it had previously held that differences in treatment based on sexual orientation require particularly serious reasons by way of justification and that same-sex couples are in a relevantly similar situation to different sex couples as regards their needs for legal recognition and protection of their relationship. It also noted, however, that since practices in that regard, since practice in that regard is still evolving across Europe, the contracting state, the member states of the European Union, enjoy a wide margin of appreciation as to the ways in which that is achieved within the domestic legal order. The court acknowledged that the consequences for Ms. Ledeal were serious in that she considered that she had no choice but to face disciplinary action rather than be designate, designated a civil partnership registrar and ultimately lost her job. The court also noted that the requirement to participate in the creation of civil partnerships was introduced subsequent to her entry, to her entry into, the employment, into employment with the council. The court said that on the other hand, the local authorities' policy aimed to secure the rights of others which are also protected under the convention. It concluded that the local authority which initiated the disciplinary proceedings and the domestic courts which, rejected Ms. Chap which had rejected her discrimination claim had not exceeded the margin of appreciation available to them. In McFarlane against the United Kingdom, another 2013 case before the European Court of Human Rights, Mr. McFarlane, a Christian, was employed as a counsellor. He was not willing to work with same-sex couples in cases where issues of psychosexual therapy were involved, and he was dismissed for that reason. The employers had an equal opportunities policy which required them to ensure, and I quote, that no person receives less favourable treatment on the basis of characteristics such as sexual orientation, end quote. On entering into his contract of employment, the claimant signed up to the employer's equal opportunities policy. The European Court of Human Rights noted that Mr McFarlane was employed by a private company. In determining whether the United Kingdom had complied with its positive obligation to secure Mr McFarlane's rights under Article 9, and whether a fair balance was struck between the competing interests at stake, the court noted that the loss of Mr. McFarlane's job was a severe sanction for him. It also noted that he was aware at the time of his enrolment that his employer operated an equal opportunities policy and that the filtering of clients on the ground of sexual orientation would not be possible. The court said, however, that the most important factor was that the employer's action was intended to secure the implementation of its policy of providing a service without discrimination. The court did not consider that the margin of appreciation allowed to the United Kingdom was exceeded, and so concluded that there had been no violation of Article 9, taken alone or in conjunction with Article 14. In Predi and Bull, the defendants, uh, and that is a domestic case, in Predi and Bull, the defendants ran a private hotel. In Black and Wilkinson, another domestic case of last year, the defendant let out rooms in her family home on a bed and breakfast basis. In both cases, the defendants were Christians who, because of their religious beliefs, operated a policy to restrict occupancy of their double-bedded rooms to married couples. In both cases, they turned away the claimants, who were homosexual couples. The claimants in Predi were in a civil partnership. The claimants in Black were partners, but not civil partners. The claimants in both cases brought proceedings alleging discrimination contrary to the Equality Act Sexual Orientation Regulations 2007. 
Those regulations contain specific exceptions, including an exception for religious organizations in Regulation 14. The Court of Appeal in both Preddy and Black concluded that there had been direct discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation because the claimants, being of the same sex, could not marry. Mr. and Mrs. Bull and Mrs. Uh, and Mrs. Wilkinson were granted permission to appeal to the Supreme Court, but Mrs. Wilkinson, that was in the Black case, decided not to pursue the appeal. While the judges in the Supreme Court disagreed on, over whether the defendants had directly, as opposed to indirectly, discriminated against the claimants on the ground of sexual orientation, with the majority led by Lady Hale finding that there had been direct discrimination, all of the judges agreed that the policy of letting double-bedded rooms only to married couples was unjustified discrimination on the base of sexual orientation within Regulation 3.3 of the Sexual Orientation Regulations. The Supreme Court also unanimously rejected the argument that the regulations needed to be read so as to give effect to the defendants' Article 9 right of freedom to manifest their religious beliefs. The limitation on the Bull's Article 9 rights was deemed a proportionate means of pursuing the legitimate aim of protecting the claimant's rights not to be unlawfully discriminated against on the basis of their sexual orientation. I turn finally and briefly to the one part of this address which I have not specifically, the one part of this, uh, this address which I have not specifically addressed, the rule of law. The rule of law is one of the fundamental principles of our uncodified democratic constitution. There are different views about its precise meaning and ambit. Uh, arguably our most distinguished uh, uh, judge uh, in recent times, the late Lord Bingham, in a book which he published shortly before his death called The Rule of Law, which has proved to be uh, very influential, put forward eight principles underlying the concept of the rule of law. He summarized its core as being that all persons and authorities within the state, whether public or private, should be bound by and entitled to the benefit of laws publicly made, taking effect generally in the future, and publicly administered by the courts, but I'm referring to a different aspect of the rule of law, which is advanced by some legal philosophers who have seen the rule of law as meaning that the law itself has certain inherent qualities, such as clarity, prospectivity, stability, openness, and access to an impartial judiciary. Uh, one of the most notable uh, of the more modern uh, legal philosophers, a man called Lon, Lon Fuller, has specified the requirements as being uh, of, of generality of the law, public promulgation of the law, stability, consistency, fidelity to purpose, and prohibition of the impossible. And I'm referring to that aspect. I refer to it here as reflecting certain inherent values in the law, those of certainty, consistency, accountability, efficiency, due process, and access to justice. It is relevant here because we can see how a body of law is steadily being built up which provides the means for resolving disputes in this very sensitive and difficult area where an individual's faith or belief system conflicts with a course of conduct imposed on him or her by a public body or someone else. As I said at the outset, any attempt at an overall appraisal of the law is beyond the scope of this address. What is clear, however, is the extraordinary distance that the law has traveled in the course of barely half a century it has moved from a Christian-centric body of law with no anti-discrimination legislation to one of neutrality towards all religions or beliefs and a complex framework of civil and criminal anti-discrimination legislation. It is an area where the state enjoys a wide margin of appreciation in balancing competing values. This does not necessarily mean, however, as some commentators have suggested, the unqualified triumph of secularism over religion. Rather, it means that the law has enlarged the space within which citizens are free to adhere to their own faith or belief system or to act in the absence of either. Interference with that right is only legally valid if in all the circumstances it is proportionate and pursuant to a legitimate object. That assessment, that is of its proportionality and pursuit of a legitimate object, is ultimately an objective one to be made by the judges. It is the very antithesis of the rule of law that it should be dependent on the faith or belief systems of individual judges. That is why Lord Justice Laws, in the McFarlane case which I've described, rejected the suggestion of the previous Archbishop of Canterbury, Lord Carey, that these cases should only be heard 
by panels of judges who have, and I quote, a proven sensitivity and understanding of religious issues, end quote. Judges are today selected in transparent and open selection processes and object against objective criteria to assess their suitability for a judicial role. Lord Carey's comment can be seen, however, as an endorsement of the principle of judicial diversity from a religious perspective. That is part of a broader and important, but perhaps no less controversial discussion about judicial diversity, but one for another day. <laughs>